Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, back to a Storage X Symposium again. Uh, my name is Yi Tui. I'm a faculty co-director of Storage X Initiative at Stanford. I also serve as the director of Critical Institute for Energy. On behalf of my co-director, Will Chair, I would like to welcome all of you back again. Uh, so today we have uh, three very exciting speakers uh, who will do a deep dive on thermal energy storage. Um, these three speakers are Ravi Pressure from uh, Lab Associate Director uh, of uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I, I will um, mention her, his background a little bit more uh, later. And Adrian Little. Um, from uh, Google X, now it's uh, Alphabet X, uh, Moonshot uh, Factory, and Brock Forest, the CTO of uh, NetPower. Uh, we also will introduce the latter two speakers. Uh, now let me uh, invite uh, Ravi uh, to the stage. Uh, let me do a, a little bit introduction about Ravi. Um, Ravi is very well known in the energy field. Uh, he's the associate lab directors of um, energy technology areas and also the uh, <clears throat> interim division director of Cyclotron World at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the UC Berkeley. Uh, Ravi has a lot of experience. He used to be an Intel before and uh, later he was recruited to uh, US Department of Energy for the uh, RPIE. He was one of the first program directors. And, and while he was there, he jump started a few really exciting program related to thermal, related to energy efficiency. One is uh, beaten, uh, the other is heat. So uh, Ravi, Ravi is very dynamic uh, person to interact if you uh, know him. I myself just enjoy so much of his uh, intellectual horsepower as well as his leadership for the uh, energy research field. Uh, with this um, short introduction, Ravi, let me invite you to give us a, a presentation. We'll do a 20 minutes presentation plus Q and A, then we'll move on to the other uh, two speakers. At the end, we'll have a panel discussion as well. Ravi, please. All right, uh, thank you very much. So uh, first of all, thank you for the kind introduction, E, both E and Will. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, storage X symposium. I've been a big fan of it and uh, try to attend as many as possible. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about a topic called dynamic and tunable thermal storage and transport. I'll touch upon the transport part a little bit. Uh, there have been few other, I believe, uh, talks related to thermal energy storage in the past. My talk is a little different in sense that the other two talks that I, I attended, at least one of them, uh, it was basically, I, I believe, where thermal energy storage was used to actually finally store electricity. So you have electricity as the input and electricity as the output. Whereas here, I'm, what I'm going to talk about is electricity is the input, but the output is thermal energy. All right, so before I get going, let me uh, acknowledge my collaborators uh, because the work that I present is has been done in collaboration with these people here. Professor Chris Dames from UC Berkeley, Dr. Suman Kaur, Dr. Gaulu, and Dr. Anvo Jan from LBNL, and Dr. Roderick Jackson from Mendel. And more or less all the funding for the work that I'm presenting here has come from the Buildings Technology Office of USDOE. So why is it important? Why is thermal storage important? Uh, particularly if you're gonna store it as the output from that storage is going to be thermal. The reason is that if you look at uh, if you look at uh, 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 the building sector, let's say it starts in the United States, buildings consume roughly seventy five percent of electricity today, right? I mean, of course, electric vehicles are going 
come are going to come on board, but the storage is already built in the car. Uh, building cooling is on the rise in the whole world significantly. In fact, here I'm showing you in this graph, uh, peak electricity demand for air conditioning, uh, in, just in two countries, India and China. And as you can see, there's a dramatic increase. Uh, already today, roughly one terawatts of power just uh, goes in supplying air conditioning door for India and China. And the world electricity production today is seven terawatts. And if you add rest of the world, including, including United States, significant amount of peak power just goes in supporting cooling. Building heating will get electrified because primarily the building heating today is supplied using natural gas almost all over the world. Uh, so it will get el electrified using mostly heat pumps or maybe some resistive heating, right? So it is expected that cooling and heating is going to be more than 50% of electrical load in buildings. So now let's look at some scenarios in the future. Today, we have mostly, as we all know, the peak electricity load on the grid is primarily driven by cooling. So that's why you have mostly uh, the, the, the peak happens during the summertime, almost all across the country you can see here. But in 2050, as I mentioned earlier, expectation is that almost all the, the heating will get electrified then we will start to see a lot of peaking electricity demand even in the winter time. The blue is the winter month and the red is the summer month, right? And, and as you know, if there is peaking, energy storage can make a very, very big difference. And then apart from peaking in the load side, there is gonna be a mismatch because it is expected that significant amount of the energy will come from renewable sources. So, so there could be a significant mismatch between where the demand is and where the supply is. And that's why energy storage is very, very important. But the question is that how much of whatever the storage we do in the future, there's a lot of different technologies that are being developed as we all know, and, and it gets covered in different talks in storage X symposium. Question, one of the questions we recently asked is that doesn't matter where you put the storage, whether it is on the grid level or it is distributed or it is a community level, doesn't matter what kind of storage it is, how much of that storage will go in supporting building thermal loads, right? A simple question. So here I'm showing you some analysis. Uh, this is, we did many different analysis, but I'm just showing you two examples here. Let's assume for the time being that it, this is for 2050, uh, the year 2050, let's assume that 50% solar and 50% wind is how we are getting electricity, okay? So this is a typical summer month and 24 hour period. The black is the supply curve for the electricity and, and the red and the gold are the demand. Red is the thermal load and the gold is the non-thermal load, right? And you can clearly see here that these are shoulder month uh, uh, hours where you will need storage because you just don't have any electricity available and you have excess supply here. And same, hold, same holds true for the winter month as well. So now we can calculate overall storage requirements just to support heating and cooling. What we found out for various scenarios, all the way from 100% solar and 0% wind to the extreme of 0% solar and 100% wind across the whole country, uh, more or less, almost all the storage will be needed in building sector to support the, th uh, uh, the thermal load, right? There will be some storage needed for the non-thermal load, for example, running uh, the computers and washers and dryers and other things. So roughly, I mean, it changes all the way, it can, the number changes all the way from one terawatt hours to five terawatt hours. But average is roughly 2.5 terawatt hours, right? Less than, less than, and then that we call it short duration, less than 10 hours, okay? So less than 10 hours of storage just to supply thermal load will be roughly 2,500 gigawatt hours or 2.5 terawatt hours. This is equivalent to roughly 50 plus million miles, the millions of electric vehicles. So that's not a small number. We are talking a fairly significant number in terms of amount of storage needed to support the thermal load in buildings. And then if you also include long duration storage, which we are not gonna talk about today, greater than 10 hours, then that number is more than 100 terawatt hours, right? So now the question is, 
the, the at least the question that we started asking is that does it make sense to store the the energy in the form of the supply which is electricity here we are assuming that uh, both the cooling and the heating is coming from a heat pump so now the question is whether we want to store the electricity in the form of supply or we want to store the uh, the energy in terms of the demand itself right so if you're storing in terms of supply, that basically you have electricity coming in and storing in a battery, either at home, like a Tesla power wall, or you're storing it somewhere on the grid, and then running a heat pump, right? And then you get the you know, energy whenever, the cooling and heating whenever you need it. Other one is that you have electricity coming in, you run a heat pump here, and then you store that output is thermal with a cooling or heating uh, load energy, and you store it in thermal battery or a thermal storage, right? There are two ways you can do it. Either you can just have a box integrated with a heat pump or you can distribute the storage in the envelope of the building. I'll talk about that later. So the second scenario, and the, which is why I'm focused on this in this talk, is electricity coming in and you store something here in thermal energy storage and output is heat. Because of that, you know, uh, things become a little interesting when you want to compare the cost. So one of the things we started looking into is that can I do an apples to apples comparison on the levelized cost of storage? And to our surprise, it's very surprising that that study did not exist. And it is a little interesting is a little complicated is because you have electricity coming in and heat going out. So you've got to apply the second law of thermodynamics, right? And that comes into picture when you are comparing the levelized cost of storage. So that comes in the form of COP, coefficient of performance. Right, and the coefficient of performance is depends on the ambient temperature because you are basically pumping the heat from the ambient temperature, right? And then, then there are other factors as well: the discounting rate, utilization, which is basically depends on uh, the depth of discharge and number of cycles. These are similar for thermal and electrical. For people who do, uh, there's so much of study on levelized cost of storage for electrical that this should be obvious to people who are doing that electrical. We do the same thing for the thermal, except for the COP. One bigger dif difference is the same the COP depends on ambient temperature, you can really tap into the diurnal temperature swing. Okay. Because what you can do is you can do the storage when the ambient temperature is low. So let's say you're pumping uh, uh, energy to do cooling, you can use the low ambient temperature. So you're if you can effectively use increase the COP and, and, and store the energy in, in the cold storage when the ambient temperature is low, say in the night. When they, and then you use that uh, stored energy, the thermal energy during the daytime when you really need the cooling. So that offers you some unique advantages in terms of thermal storage, just tapping into the, the diurnal temperature swing. So here are some results. I'm not gonna bore you with uh, most of these charts here. We analyze various scenarios. One is one, one very important factor is that this idea of tapping into the diurnal temperature swing. For example, Denver, Colorado has significant diurnal temperature swing, whereas San Diego, California does not have diurn significant diurnal temperature swing, right? So the results differ and the storage becomes a little bit more attractive for Denver, Colorado, for example. But what we found out that the state of the art thermal energy storage, the levelized cost is significantly lower uh, than uh, state-of-the-art lithium and battery. And you will also see that the utilization here for thermal energy storage is smaller than the utilization for the lithium and batteries, right? Because challenge with thermal energy storage is right now the way the technology today is, either you can store heat or you can store cold, right? That means you won't be using it for throughout the year. Whereas that's the beauty of lithium and batteries or, or any electrical battery that you can use it every day. So the utilization is significantly higher, right? But still, the levelized cost of storage is cheaper primarily in most of the cases, not all the cases, is because of increased lifetime. So thermal energy storage can you know, survive for 30 years. There are a lot of field data available also. It has much cheaper capital cost. And also it can be potentially used to reduce the size of the heat pump itself. Heat pumps are very expensive because you can tap into the diurnal temperature swing and you can actually make this heat pump smaller. It's almost like a hybrid car where you can have a smaller engine combined with 
uh, uh, with a battery, right? And then further reduction is possible if you can increase the utilization of the thermal energy storage and you bring it from here to here, right? So the question is, if it is so simple and it looks so economically attractive, why isn't why don't we see it everywhere, right? That is where the, it, the, the, this research becomes very interesting. And the question is very interesting because there are some fundamental materials and chemistry questions that, that, that that's the reason uh, you know, it is not ubiquitous. Since this is a, a symposium organized by Stanford University, I have to tell you, maybe a lot of you are aware of it, that Stanford already uses thermal energy storage to supply the thermal load uh, 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 in the campus. So you have, uh, this is a hot water tank. And these, are two, these two tanks uh, keep chilled water. They run a heat pump and, and when the electricity is cheap and then use that energy uh, to uh, store hot, hot and cold and then use that to supply all the thermal load. I believe almost 100% of the load is catered through this by this these tanks here, right? That's great. Stanford is a, has a beautiful campus. It has a lot of land, a lot of area, and you can afford to have very gigantic tanks. But that's not the luxury that we have in all the houses as well as apartments, right? And the reason is that fundamental reason, the energy density of thermal energy storage is low. Uh, for what I'm showing you here is a thermophysical storage, which basically means just like these tanks here, use a heating or cooling, right, a material, or you're also melting a material. I'll talk about that later. So that is phase change based storage. Or you can also, so here you have the, the phase change or the, or the thermophysical storage has pretty good volumetric energy density, but very, very low gravimetric, gravimetric energy density. Whereas thermochemical storage, where you can store the energy in chemical bonds, have very good gravimetric energy density, but very low volumetric energy density. The reason is because most of the thermochemical storage uses a gas phase, so solid in a gas phase, okay? Lithium ion, this is at the material level, sits somewhere here. So that's a very big question. How do we increase the energy density? So there are a few potential strategies. Uh, one is if you can distribute the storage in the envelope of the building, and I'll talk about that in the next few slides, then you can solve the problem, or you can develop new molecules for high energy density. I'll touch upon that a little bit. And also maybe you can come up with some innovative system design, right? So let me start with the distributed storage and envelope. Any building has a lot of wall area available as we know that, right? So imagine that if you can embed in this wall a thin slab of a phase chain material, okay? And then you can store the energy by melting and solidifying this material here, right? We did some math. A typical 2,000 square foot residential building can store roughly 150 kilowatt hour thermal or thermal energy in it, right? This is equivalent to nine hours of cooling in a typical building, okay? However, there's another challenge here that you need, you know, when you store the energy, the energy will start to leak, you know, because uh, at a, there is no perfect phononic insulator. The phonons leak, the heat will leak. So we also need some kind of a thermal switch. Okay, and that's where the trans tunable transport becomes very, very important, right? So now, and the idea of putting a storage inside the building is not new. People have uh, an envelope, but the idea of combining with a thermal switch, I believe is fairly new. And that is what we have proposed and we got some uh, funding to do the research on that. But let me give you a quick example of, of, of show that how the switch helps. This is uh, from our collaborator at NREL. Uh, so you have, you know, the typical wall, we have insulation and other material in the wall. You just put a phase change material. First of all, if you don't put the phase change material, uh, one day cooling load, thermal load in this scenario is, you know, 0.52, for example. And then you put the phase change material, it reduces the load by almost 15%, right? But still not significant reduction. But if you put a thermal switch here, it dramatically reduces the load, right? because the switch lets you really control the flow of energy, right? And that really helps dramatically. So switch has a big impact to play. As I said, the idea of putting storage in the walls is not new. Uh, you know, people have tried it. And, and actually there are startups as well. However, the field data actually is, is, is not very promising. Uh, here's a field data from one study where you see that 
some of the walls in the, that building where the field data was collected was 0% active, right? That means the phase change material never changed phase, okay? Other times we were only partially active, right? Why? What happened here is, is I'm showing you something called a phase change indicator. It's almost equivalent to depth of discharge in a battery, okay? Zero means it's completely in solid state, and one means it is completely melted. All the material is melted. In between means that partially melted and partially solidified, right? So that's like, uh, just like lithium and battery, you have a depth of discharge in less than one. And you can see, it's most of the time, nothing, that it doesn't change the phase at all. It just starts, stays stagnant, right? So, that means the material, just, the, the system is just inactive. You have a dead capital sitting there. So traditional approaches has not worked. And one of the main reasons is that the ambient temperature uh, fluctuates. So what happens is that your facial material is a fixed melting temperature and the ambient temperature is fluctuating dramatically. It, and, and it is not changing its phase because depending on the ambient temperature, it's not changing its own melting temperature and behavior. So there is a study which was done, which shows that if you do not have, if you have a traditional phase change material, whether it's with a fixed uh, you know, phase change temperature, it, 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 it's just most of the time it is either in a liquid state or, or in solid state. But if you could design a thermal and storage material where you could change, dynamically tune the phase change temperature, matching some of the changes in the ambient temperature, then you can increase the utilization. As you can see, back and forth, there's a lot of charging, discharging happening. So, <laughs> and, and then it increases the utilization of the stored material by 20x. So tunable transition temperature, ability to store both hot and cold, can dramatically increase the overall utilization of thermal energy storage material, particularly if you put it in an envelope of a building. So here is the idea. You know, you, you basically, here's the ambient temperature, variation and you have a flat, uh, traditional material has a flat uh, you know, melting temperature, but if you could match this profile, that will be great. And that's what we recently just published our first paper, where actually we learned from the, you know, the, the electrochemical community that, and this is, we know already that if you put ions and salts, it changes the melting temperature. Question is going to be, can you dynamically tune it? So basically, can you put, ions in, take ions out. So you basically, you can change the transition temperature from you know, 18 degrees, for example, in this case to 25 degrees, depending on how many ions are inside this phase change material. In this case, it's, it's a peg. And so here is first data, this, this, this paper just came out a few days ago, uh, uh, the, where we have shown that we can dynamically tune uh, by applying voltage, the phase change temperature by almost seven degrees. And, uh, and so, and that's one aspect. Other one is that it, this also shows some promise of that we can combine thermal energy storage and electrical energy storage in one device that can hopefully increase the utilization of that device, but they're very preliminary, but it looks very, very promising at this point. Let me move on, change gears a little bit. I talk about some other ways of storing energy. One of them is in the form of fluids, which is always used used for both the heat transfer and storage. Microelectronics, this is where I started my career. Significant interest in doing liquid cooling. Uh, this is the patent or Tesla pat patent where you, all of us know that Tesla uses liquid cooling for, to cool the batteries. Transformers use liquid cooling, uh, you know, uh, in terms of mean oils. And then there's a lot of interest right now. There are quite a few startups. I just took one, I think it's a company called Harvest Thermal. They're using, again, heat pump and a storage tank to store the thermal energy. So if you're using fluid, then the heat transfer rate and the storage density is directly proportional to heat capacity. So, so, so the question is, how can we increase the heat capacity of fluids? That's why the, this becomes interesting. That most of the thermal fluids, artificially designed thermal fluids, are basically van der Waals bonded molecules, right? And, and the bond energy, as we know, is pretty low. For less than five kilos per mole, that's basically translates into low heat capacity. Water has the highest heat capacity, but 70% of the heat capacity in water comes from hydrogen bond breaking, which we is like 30, 10 to 30 kilojoules per mole. So now can we use covalent bond breaking, which has very high bond energy to beat water or achieve high heat capacity? And also 
one of the challenge with water is that as you know it freezes at 0 degree celsius and boils at 100 degree celsius so question is you know can we also expand the temperature window right so there is a class of reaction which is very well known in the chemistry community called Diels-Alder reactions. Uh, it was actually proposed in late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and, and the reason is that it has a very high reaction enthalpy, which is great for the heat capacity, but it also has a very high uh, entropy of reaction. That's very important because if you have a low entropy of reaction, then the turning temperature will be very, very high. High entropy of reaction allows the turning temperature to be moderate. And then many times these reactions happen in liquid phase. So that makes it very interesting from the point of view of designing thermal fluids. We just got our first data where uh, uh, on some well-known molecules. Here's the heat capacity. Blue is the data of this thermochemical fluid. In a, and this is water here, right here. In a narrow temperature range, now we are able to beat water, right? And then water is never hardly used pure in a, uh, in a heat, heat transfer fluid directly. You also mix it with uh, antifreeze like ethylene glycol or propylene glycol. Enthyl the propylene glycol and ethylene glycol heat capacity is here, much, much lower, right? And then mineral oil is another very well known heat transfer fluid and storage medium. It is right here, much lower, right? So you can see that the, the heat capacity is much, much higher than most of the other liquids and also a little higher than that of water. That's one. Viscosity is also very, very important. Most of the liquids have very, very high viscosity except water. But this one has also a pretty decent viscosity, much, much lower than some of the other liquids. So that also makes it very interesting. Uh, more importantly, we also used DFT to see whether we can predict the performance. So DFT can predict the, uh, the enthalpy of reaction. Then we use the Eyring equation for rate of reaction, where again DFT can predict the uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the reaction kinetics, uh, and and then the data that the the black is the DFT result, and and the colored is the uh, the the data, and it matches fairly well. So that allows us now to start investigating uh, that can we design the molecules artificially. So we have started doing some work where we have started putting functional groups on the different molecules. And you can see that we can tune, depending on where, what the functional group is, we can tune the transition temperature. Uh, like for example, in this case, the peak temp heat capacity is happening around 70 degrees, where in another molecule, the peak heat capacity is happening around 110 degrees. So again, that, that work is going on now because now we have confidence that DFT does a pretty decent job in predicting. Uh, very quickly, I said systems uh, innovation can also lead to some uh, uh, dramatic improvements. Uh, this was a project that I had funded at MIT when I was at RPI as a program director, where this team from Evelyn Vance Group, they combined heating and cooling into one system. And, and actually they used an adsorbent here. And, and instead of just using ice, they use water vapor, except the vapor was not kept in a vapor state, but it was absorbed in an adsorbent. That leads to a significantly increased energy density. That's a really good example of a system level innovation. And also, since you're bo storing both heat and cold in one system, that means utilization can go up significantly higher because you can use it almost throughout the year. You can use it for heating during uh, cold uh, uh, months, and then you can use it for cooling during the uh, hot months. I wanna to quickly touch upon this uh, in a minute or so, then, then I'll wrap up. As I mentioned earlier, that the thermal switch can make a very, very big difference uh, in, in the performance. And thermal fluid switch has a lot of other applications as well. Actually, I want to highlight uh, uh, some very, very good work coming out of electrochem electrochemical thermal switches. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see this is what came, actually came from Ken Goodson and e, E's group, uh, where uh, Aditya Sood was a PhD student. And, and he used, uh, they showed that using ion intercalation they could change the thermal conductivity by almost an order of magnitude or thermal conductance by on an order of magnitude, right? And you can basically you have a switch. It's all, it is, uh, and then you can control the conductance. So, and, and, and the very first work actually came from David Cahill's group where he looked at a lithium ion battery and lithium cobalt oxide, which is the basic material on the cathode side. He could show that by intercalation that the lithium could change the thermal conductivity quite significantly. So anyway, so we believe that 
this is a really interesting direction. It has a lot of other applications. The last slide is that we are working on another method where we are just using a shape memory alloy, which allows you to contact and decontact two surfaces together. And that can lead to a significantly higher switch ratio. And we are developing some devices for buildings application. With that, I'm just gonna stop and leave this slide in the background. Thank you. I think you're, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Hi, Ravi, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, so let's ask a few questions for now, then we'll come back to panel because the later uh, topics also related. Uh, so Ravi, uh, when you show that picture, <laughs> the Stanford's uh, our heat pump, heat storage, cold storage, right? I was thinking um, for single family house, um, well, certainly not for apartment, for single family house, um, so you probably have done a calculation if using use the same idea, uh, hot and cold storage right there. Uh, wh what kind of footprint size, right? Expected wh whether that makes sense. You're know, using water tank idea for single family. Yeah, I want to pick your brain a little bit on that. No, that's a great question. I mean, I quite frankly, I feel that that's going to require quite a bit of space. Okay, like if a fifty gallon water tank. Mm -hmm. is traditionally used just to supply hot water for shower and stuff, right? Imagine that now you use that water tank also to supply space heating, for example, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to increase the footprint a lot. One way to do it, that is also that you do underground, right? I mean, you, if you have, you can just bury that thing inside the ground. So that way, at least you don't have to worry about the footprint. Mm -hmm. but then, then, then you have to really look into the overall cost of excavation and stuff as well, which I've not looked into, right? So that's one. Second challenge is that, you know, if you put it outside the garage, right, you know, because you have, to, then again, yeah. you have to worry about freezing and stuff, depending on which climate you are in. So, 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 so I think one other thing which is very interesting is if you can look at a phase change material, because the phase change has much, much higher energy density compared to just, uh, uh, you know, storing energy in, 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 in liquids. Yeah, but but yeah. I but I think that's a complex question. I would say that on one hand, from our point of view, researchers' point of view, looking at new molecules is very exciting. But from pra from practical point of view, also ideas like burying some of these tanks underground could be equally interesting too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ravi. Um, the second questions uh, I have is um, I I really like your idea and uh, going to a direction explore the covalent bond <laughs> for storing energy, right? So, um, and uh, your uh, initial exploration is really, really interesting. Uh, uh, you carry a lot of energy. Certainly now the question becomes uh, whether you can find something that allow you to reversibly turn it back and forth, you know, um, and without too big energy barrier, right? With, um, so it's very interesting. I want to ask, you know, in terms of bond formation, covalent bond is one type. Another bond is ionic bonding. Um, and uh, sometimes maybe, I because covalent bond is so directional, it's actually a, 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 this, a, a quite a bit of challenge to find the right system, but ionic bonding could be system. Have you looked into that? That's uh, ionic bond breaking and reformation. Uh, it's electrostatic, uh, mostly with that nature. Would that be easier? This is this idea just come up listening to your talks. I have no idea, so that's why. No, I, mean, I, tell you, I, I that's a very good. I, that is why I put it here in the talk because I think I would say put it this way, right? I think we need to go into molecular scale understanding to if you want to design new molecules and new ways. So whether it, so the game is on whether it's ionic or covalent or hydrogen bonds, and I think uh, I, I I would I I we have not personally looked at it. Right, but on the other hand, I think that is very interesting. I mean, even even I would say even for the high high temperature storage, which which is we which you use for electricity storage, right? You know, you're gonna if you want to run a heat engine based on that storage. So, I think this field is very open in in many ways, both from fundamental science as well as engineering point of view. Uh, so yes, I, we have not looked into ourselves of the ionic bonding. Yeah. So Ravi, let's take one more question then let's move on to the other talks. Um, so one, one person asks, uh, does the heat capacity of the phase change materials, when is it liquid state? Uh, does that not deliver some energy during hotter summers? 
because it's already a melted state. And uh, I mean, the, this is for clarification, right? It's uh, um, during hot summer, you need cooling, then uh, does that uh, will not work deliver some energy? I mean, that's- I, I, I mean, it can. I mean, I quite frankly, I didn't put it here. You can also combine phase change and just sensible, let's say water, for example, just as an example, you can make ice during the summer month and you can use that same thing to heat it up during the winter month, right? So goes water to all before it becomes steam. Yeah. Right. But again, yeah. there are some engineering challenges that somebody will need to, will have to figure it out because when it becomes ice, the heat, the thermal conductivity and heat transfer is very, very different in the solid state than it is in the liquid state, right? So yeah. how do you manage the engineering yeah. and the heat exchanger and stuff will be different, but but on the other hand, potentially it can increase the same system can be used throughout the year for both heating and cooling. Yeah. So, uh, but that will be some very interesting engineering challenges. Okay. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, for the time consideration, uh, Ravi, just a few questions in Q&A. If you want to type in the answer to the uh, oh, uh, yeah. those folks, yeah. uh, uh, feel free to do so. Now let me invite uh, my co-director, uh, Will Chair, to the stage to introduce the, uh, the, the other two speakers. Thank you very much, E and Ravi. Thank you for the great talk and, uh, and setting the scene uh, for thermal storage. I have many questions I'll ask you later as well. Um, if I can also uh, invite uh, Adrian and Brock uh, to the stage, please. Perfect, wonderful. So uh, you've heard quite a bit from Ravi on the materials development and introduction to thermal storage. And Adrian and Brock will now take this into the systems level discussion. So let me introduce Adrian and Brock a bit more. Uh, so Adrian uh, is currently with uh, Google um, in the Moonshot factory. And previously, she was a systems technical lead at Malta, uh, which is developing thermal energy storage. And uh, she is also, like Robbie, spent time at RPE in the Department of Energy, uh, where she was a fellow. And Brock Forrest, uh, he is the CTO of NetPower, and uh, he is uh, an expert in designing thermodynamic cycles and rolling out um, large thermal and electrothermal systems at scale. And um, he's been working on several hundreds of megawatts projects uh, with net power, uh, looking at supercritical CO2 cycles. So Adrian and Brock, we're very much looking forward to the systems level discussion, which is a very crucial one uh, for thermal storage. The floor is yours. Cool, thank you for the intro. Um, we're gonna switch gears uh, quite a bit here. Uh, and go for something that is maybe quite a bit different from what is typically seen on this lecture series. Um, what myself and Brock will be talking about are kind of the, the nuts and bolts practical challenges of taking something from the lab and building out uh, a first thing in, a, in the field on a real customer site, commissioning, turning it on for the first time and operating it. Uh, I've, you know, as as mentioned previously, I saw a lot of uh, technology ideas come across my desk at RPE. Since then, I've been involved with a few different startups, directly and indirectly. And what I'm trying to convey here is my generalized observations of the early stage, uh, let's say, energy industry, and basically convey those learnings to you so that if you are working on an early stage technology, if you're doing a startup, or even if you're at a slightly later stage where you're just about ready to turn your plant on, maybe there will be some things here that will help guide you and push you in the right direction so that you're most likely to succeed in actually bringing your storage technology to market. Um, so in terms of what we'll be talking about here, uh, we'll be not just talking about thermal energy storage. We won't even just be talking about energy storage I'll be talking about anything that is a, basically an industrial scale facility uh, that needs to be built and operated for the first time. And so I'll start off here with this image I found. This is, I found this at a hydro dam built by BC Hydro out in British Columbia. And I was quite uh, uh, charmed by this image, but I think it's really perfect to explain kind of the scenario that we're in right now. 
you can see the little baby at the bottom, which is electricity storage, of course. Of course, this was in reference to the hydro dam, a different sort of energy storage. Uh, but we're looking at various other types as well. Um, for example, thermal energy storage, which can be converted uh, to electricity. And so kind of the scenario we're in right now is we have a lot of baby ideas uh, and a lot of baby plants for thermal energy storage or for energy storage. And we see the big giants on the fossil side or on the process industry side who are kind of looking at us and wondering what's gonna happen to that kind of new nascent technology uh, in thermal energy storage. So in terms of uh, a little bit of a background of the talk here and kind of my background and where I'm coming from having, you know, learned various lessons in the thermal energy storage space and trying to convey them here. Um, Brock, if, if you just want to say a few words to introduce yourself really quick, um, go ahead and then I can start jumping into the meat of our presentation. Yeah, so um, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, so I started working in the energy sector about close to a decade ago, uh, focused predominantly on supercritical CO2 power generation. And when I started um, in this field, I was dealing with something that was little more than, we'll say, uh, heat and mass balance. It was not much better than uh, chicken scratch on the back of a napkin. Um, and I worked you know, very uh, intensely uh, with the chief engineer of the company I was working with called Eight Rivers at that time to take something from uh, quote unquote chicken scratch all the way through to you know, a facility worth more than $100 million that's now industrial scale, experimental lab test facility for moving on to the next generation of, of clean um, fossil-based power. And so I've gotten to live the life cycle of, you know, you, you have this great idea, you got to convince people to give you money, um, you got to build it, you got to design it, you have to deal with, we'll say, the hiccups that come along the way, and you have to pivot in terms of your commercial, uh, commercial future. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about that, the kind of the growing pains of brilliant idea to uh, how do you actually get the thing to a point where you have an impact in the world? So thank you very much, Adrian. Great, thanks, Brock. And we'll explain this a little bit more later, but uh, Brock's company, NetPower, um, is not strictly an energy storage system. However, it does have a lot of the same uh, challenges in uh, technology development and build a first of a kind plant that are highly relevant to any large scale thermal energy storage. So uh, diving into it, slide. okay, great. So, okay, let's get serious about solving climate change. What exactly do we have to do to get to our goals uh, of, of uh, limiting global warming? So I took a look at the IPCC report, the one from 2018, and uh, you know, they had a lot of data in there in terms of how much renewable uh, electricity generation capacity we need to install to reach our goals. And so by 2050, they're predicting under one, I'll take a sample scenario here, by 2050, we need to install nine terawatts of renewable electricity generation. So I ran some back of the envelope calculations and I was like, how much do we actually have to build to get to that level of, of like hardware installation? So if you take uh, the Three Gorges Dam uh, in China, it's the largest uh, hydro facility in the world, 22.5 gigawatts, it took 18 years to build. If we replaced all renewable, or if, if we did all of this renewable capacity just with hydro dams of this scale, we would have to build one to two of them a month, every month for the next 30 years. Similarly, um, if we did this with the world's largest nuclear plant, it's eight gigawatts, it's in Japan, we'd have to build one of those 10 days, or sorry, one of those every 10 days for the next 30 years. This is a lot of steel going in the ground and going in a lot faster than has ever been done before. Okay, let's take that a step further. We know we can't just put a ton of renewable energy generation. Uh, we also need storage. Uh, so let's say we have 50% renewable penetration. We may or may not need more than that depending on what energy mix we choose. Uh, but if we do that, if we take the, the Tesla 100 megawatt uh, lithium ion battery plant that took 100 days to build, we need one to two of those a month, every month for the next 30 years. And that's just for the US. And then if we're doing uh, carbon capture and sequestration, there's a whole bunch of other stuff we need to build there as well. So basically what I'm trying to convey here is that we need to build things faster. 
And we're running into a lot of roadblocks in that process of building faster. And so there are a lot of great ideas out there, including the one that Ravi just presented. And it's kind of like, okay, great. I want to use this. I want to build it. I want to get it out to customers. Um, but again, this is incredibly slow. Like why? Let's break this down. Why is it so hard to actually build these things? So I can give you a whole laundry list of reasons here. I'm not going to go through every individual thing on the list here. If you're interested, there's a, a book by uh, Bill Bonvillian. Uh, he's He's a player in the US manufacturing space, but he does a lot of thought leadership in terms of innovation, what he calls legacy sectors. And I think it's just kind of funny that the cover of this book is you know, a guy rolling a giant stone up a hill that's inevitably going to fall back down and he's going to poop it back up. It's interesting. Um, I feel like that sometimes. Um, anyways, he, he puts a lot of thought into like specifically what are the, the things that are stopping us, things like perverse subsidies, uh, codes and standards are difficult from a regulatory standpoint, um, little focus on implementation. Um, but I'll, I'm going to zoom in on a few specific things that I've seen and try to explain them um, in, a, uh, in a way that I hope is a bit more uh, digestible. Um, so let's say theme number one uh, is basically there's a bottleneck to how many of these novel or early stage technologies, how many of them are able to get through that bottleneck and actually become operating plants. And if I were to generalize, I would say that the two main things limiting us or that are creating this bottleneck are basically limited options for mobilizing capital, getting, as, getting the quantity of money we need and getting it fast enough and having patient capital that is willing to tolerate longer timelines. I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second. And then the other one is actually the construction process. It's very difficult to construct, especially first of a kind plants uh, fast. Uh, typically there are a lot of delays and complications as you're building something out for the first time. And it's also kind of an unpredictable murky process. Like how, as an early stage company or team, how do you correctly interface with the EPCs of the world, the vendors and contractors, the suppliers of the world? and uh, bring them along in your process such that you have a, a smoother construction process and higher chance of success at the end when you go to turn your plant on. And so I'll go into that specific one in more detail in a sec. But let's start with the limited options for mobilizing capital. Um, so if we look at kind of the, this funding uh, map here, um, you know, you hear of things like the Valley of Death, you know, trying to get over that Valley of Death, uh, typically sometimes is referred to as a manufacturing Valley of Death. I'm talking more about like an implementation build out type of Valley of Death. And really what's happening is that there's this kind of gap here that I've highlighted large scale demonstrations where there aren't a lot of places to get funds for these sorts of projects. No one, or I shouldn't say no one, uh, it is especially challenging to get funding for your first of a kind plant it is less challenging to get uh, funding for your second, third, fourth kind of a plant. Um, on top of that, uh, one of the challenges here is that capital is typically, um, or rather the timelines of build construction and later build and later construction of second, third, fourth of a kind, those timelines are just typically a bit too slow uh, for the return rates that you typically see at, let's say your standard venture capital firm or your standard private investor, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's one issue. Another issue is that um, going to the construction issue, trying to break down like why exactly is construction so slow and challenging. And so a trend that I've noticed is that for, even for nth of a kind plants, things that we know we've built a million times before. So let's say a natural gas turbine power plant or something like that, a mining facility things that are big and heavy hardware sort of facilities, but you know, we've, we've done it before. Um, this here was a study from McKinsey where they basically looked through a database of timeline and spend for a range of these different kind of known assets. And basically the conclusion that they came to was that 98% of these known projects uh, incurred cost overruns. And uh, on average, they were slipping more than 20 months behind schedule. Um, and so this is kind of like a systematic 
uh, issue in the construction industry. And, you know, building fast, even when you know what you're doing, is really hard. And so, okay, that's for nth of a kind plants. That's for things that we know. First of a kind plants are uh, especially difficult because, in you know, in, uh, you have those kind of initial challenges of the construction industry being slow. And then on top of that, you have these kind of other issues. Um, with the first of a kind plant in, let's say we're doing thermal energy storage or energy storage for load shifting of electricity, let's say that for now, even if you're load shifting heat or something like that, um, you're in the end competing on price. It's hard to differentiate your electron from the electron of your competitor or your uh, phonon from the phonon of your competitor, however you want to say it. Um, and so that makes it difficult for customers to be more selective and say like, yes, I want your product. Uh, the other main issue uh, in the middle here <clears throat> is that as a small startup company, you don't have a very big balance sheet. And so it's very, you can say as much as you want, you can claim as much as you want as an early startup company about your metrics. Uh, but in the end, you don't have any capital kind of backup or provide warranties for that performance. And that makes people and that makes customers uh, nervous. They're worried that you're either going to break their grid, and so you spend a lot of time getting a grid interconnection study done to prove that you won't uh, break their grid, or they're concerned that you're going to break yourself, and then they're going to lose all the, the the capital investment that they they made in you. Uh, and then finally, at the end, there the last kind of big challenge that's unique to first of a kind plants is well, and second of a kind and third of a kind, honestly. Uh, there's a very high risk financial environment. People wanna know exactly how much money you're going to make. Well, guess what? The markets for energy storage of various durations aren't mature yet. Um, and on top of that, if you're looking at pull, pulling multiple revenue streams for your energy storage asset, those aren't priced yet. So it's very difficult to say conclusively how much money you're gonna make your customer. So, Okay, yeah, and so um, it, you kind of end up having this sort of challenge uh, when you're in an energy storage startup. It's like, I want to build a thing. I don't have the all the money I want, so I have to build a simplified version of it. But how do I build something that's kind of good enough? How do I build the skateboard so that I can live long enough to build the scooter, to build the bike, to build the motorcycle? You don't want to build a wheel to start off with that's completely useless and then just have grumpy customers that lose interest in you. And so you're balancing all these different things, the juggling act, and it's, you're, you're trying to make smart um, decisions here, essentially, on how to, how to build out your tech. Okay, so I've done a lot of complaining. Uh, I've pointed out a lot of issues and I will make an attempt here to make some recommendations on how we can progress here as academics, as non-academics, um, when, when we're trying to really get serious about putting steel on the ground and moving the needle in terms of climate change. Um, and yeah, my hint here is basically, it's basically all in how you choose what to work on. So let me explain that in a bit more detail. Um, I've seen that often companies are optimizing for the wrong metric. Um, when you talk to customers, especially in the large scale thermal energy storage or energy storage space, um, typically the desire um, is to optimize first for reliability and safety. These are the things that get your foot in the door and convince them uh, that you should operate on their land for the first time. They're often less concerned about efficiency and cost. They're very important, but that is not necessarily going to be the thing that you have to prove for them to ap approve your building on their land. Um, the other way to think about this is typically we think about technology development from the bottom up, start with the fundamental research and then go, to the, go through the stages to make it more mature. Um, I would argue, or rather my opinion is, we should start thinking about doing this in the opposite way. And this is a lot of kind of customer outreach stuff, understanding your markets, things like that. But there's, there's also a technical element to this. So if you go to your customer and you talk to them, they say, I want a system that has an uptime metric or a reliability metric of 99% uptime. 
you might design that thermal energy storage system in a very different way with lots of redundancy, for example. And then your requirements trickle down and then you say, okay, this fundamental research area makes sense because it addresses all of these kind of customer requirements from day one. Uh, and then I would say when you're choosing which technology to work on or when you're refining the one that you're already working on, um, instead of, again, just thinking about optimizing for efficiency or cost, there's a lot of other kind of product or system features that are actually incredibly important later on when you're trying to commercialize your technology. You know, I've, I've listed a bunch here. The more you can satisfy with your technology, the better. Um, but just to um, emphasize one or two here, for example, operational flexibility. What's really uh, unique to energy storage is that inherently it has to load follow. It has the charge, it has the discharge. Often you're looking at full load, partial load. This is a very transient thermal system. And we are not, we're, we're kind of in this new, uh, let's say area of optimizing thermal systems to operate in transient ways. Uh, like previous industries um, have always bent over backwards and contorted themselves to always operate at steady state. And so this is like a fundamentally different way of thinking about thermal systems and how you design them for thermal cycles. And this is necessary if you want to target more markets as a thermal energy storage asset. Another one I'll highlight is use existing ecosystems. Uh, this means things like supply chain. Where's your labor going to come from? Can you use trained um, welders as they are, or do you have to completely retrain them in something else? Think about how, like, who's actually gonna build this and how, and where are the parts and the bits and pieces going to come from? Do you have to reinvent the manufacturing wheel to make your thermal energy storage technology work? Or can you use the existing manufacturing options out there? Uh, and then, yeah, embrace system mindset. So, you know, I've become a thermal systems engineer. I used to be at the component level, but now I'm at the system level. And often what happens is there's a lot of focus on, let's say, what I call the core technology. So let's say if you're working in hydrogen, you focus really a lot on the stack. Uh, but um, what ends up happening is that so much attention is put on the stack that you forget about the balance of plants or the balance of system. You forget about the purification steps. You forget about the, um, the compression step afterwards, for example. There's a lot of other stuff that has to go into your product to make it work. And then often when you add these things in after the fact, you find that your system costs, I don't know, 10x more than you originally thought. And so the, the kind of elephant in the room, as I say, is that you know, when you're evaluating a new technology, like have you thought about the full system yet and what the cost implications and what the oper operability um, uh, implications are going to be? Okay, and so uh, that's essentially the, the things I had to say. Again, my generalizations um, from having seen the progress of many different startups in the, in the energy space. Um, and so let's, let's hear from Brock. Uh, again, he doesn't, he, that power is not an energy storage uh, technology, not thermal energy storage technology, but it does have a deal with a lot of these similar challenges of building out big industrial assets. Uh, and so he'll present uh, a little bit and explain what net power is all about and kind of work in some of less of his lessons learned uh, since he's actually had a lot of boots on the ground at these facilities that they've been built up. Um, so Brock, I'll hand it off to you. Just let me know when you want me to switch slides. Yeah, well, let's just move on to the next slide. Um, so to thank you everybody for, for being here. Um, kind of just to give you a little bit of background why net power has relevance to uh, this conversation. When you talk about like grid level thermal energy storage, you're still talking about EPC level concrete, steel, piping systems, um, control systems, you know, training operators, heat exchangers, um, your, you know, whether or not you're going, we'll say solar thermal to a steam plant or you're doing pebble bed heaters, um, you're still kind of like grappling with the same issues of how do I take something the industry's not used to building right now? They've got the raw skill set, they've got the, the hardware capabilities, but you're trying to teach them how to build a new mousetrap. Um, and that's kind of, we'll say, some of the lessons learned we got with NetPower. 
um, you know, this slide here is just kind of showing the, the, the credentials of the people who've, who've really built net power. It's a diverse group of people. Um, uh, as Adrian said earlier, I'm the CTO of, or um, as we said earlier, I'm the CTO of net power. I've been working in power infrastructure for the last 10 years, predominantly supercritical CO2. Um, and I can tell you it's been a fun ride, but it's not easy. Uh, it's something that really requires you to dig in and go from academic to the nuance of, you know, uh, ushering or uh, taking care of your baby and showing people actually how to do something right from the process design standpoint and learning from them. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, Adrian, please. So this is an example of the test facility that we built. I started working on this about nine and a half years ago. Um, it's an industrial scale plant. So it, like I said, uh, we went from you know, basic Aspen plus heat and mass balance that you would ask, you know, uh, third year undergrad in chemical engineering to design um, to building something that was well north of $100 million with the investment from strategics. Um, so there's clearly, you know, been a lot of information we've, we've garnered in terms of what it takes to go from uh, the brilliant idea of Jeremy Fedfet and um, uh, Rodney Allen uh, to a plant that actually is functioning and working and until about midnight last night, I was actually at that facility. So uh, I can talk a little bit more about that later, but um, let's go on to the next slide. So how is this relevant? Okay, so we saw that we needed a clean future. We saw that we needed a clean future now. Um, the inventors of the net power technology understood that uh, the infrastructure around fossil fuels is ready. Um, it may not be the answer everybody wants, but how could we make it cleaner? Um, so we started from the ground up, redesigned an entire power system, uh, assuming that thermal energy uh, could be sourced from existing infrastructure and we could capture all the carbon. Um, we would basically want to create low cost uh, electricity with fully integrated carbon capture. And that wasn't really possible with existing infrastructure. Um, so we were dealing with a new mousetrap that really never been seen before. Um, when you start talking about supercritical CO2, you know, high pressure carbon dioxide, you know, 30 megapascals, you're north of um, 1100 C, you're dealing with chemistries that are typically in the oil and gas sector, not the power sector. Uh, you really are forcing people who build power plants to look at things in a new way. In reality, you're hybridizing skill sets. And a lot of that's going to be uh, comparable to grid level thermal energy storage, because you're going to be asking people to build things that have typically been done at the pilot scale, or even we'll say smaller than that, um, you know, desktop scale, uh, and turn it into something that actually has, we'll say, bankability, insurability, safety standards, uh, et cetera. Those are things you don't think about necessarily when you first start developing a project. It's like, you know, do I have to think about installation on a piece of pipe? How does it affect the operations? Does it mess with my process design? And why am I doing this? Um, and so I'll get a little bit into that uh, later on. But, you know, we started off, we wanted to make clean energy, exploiting existing infrastructure so we could move as quickly as possible while allowing electricity prices to remain low cost so the world was not penalized and there was no business case against going clean. Um, so next slide, please. So, I mean, these, these, this kind of talks about, you know, the, the big, we'll say, mission uh, of what we were trying to do. Um, but the one thing I want to emphasize is that uh, when we talk to customers and to Adrian's point earlier, you know, kind of looking at like the end stage and then reverse engineering how you should be developing the concept became uh, critically important. Um, and one of the best things we learned was that capacity factor was probably the most important thing you should be looking at. Um, capacity factor in the face of levelized cost of electricity. And this is going to be true for thermal energy storage. Um, you can design the most efficient widget out there. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be regulated utilities that have to serve, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, uh, electricity at rates that are dependable and, and outputs that are dependable, that are really going to have the final say. You know, they don't mind it being a little bit more expensive because it's a little bit less efficient if they get an availability and capacity factor that guarantees the lights never flicker. And so that was something you know we learned kind of, we'll say mid stage was that um, people cared less about efficiency and more about reliability. And that's kind of something that was really hard to grasp when I first started on this, in this, in this, uh, on this path was that um, you wanna create the highest performing system, uh, but that is not what turns into dollars at the end of the day. Um, you know, think about utilities get penalized if for some reason they can't actually supply because they have these guaranteed contracts. So if you've got a thermal energy storage system that only has a capacity factor of 70%, but when it's working, it's, you know, 80, 90% efficient, 
that's great, but they're going to want you to be 85, 90% capacity factor, and they'll take the decay in performance. And that's kind of something that we learned. Like, so these mission statements were really what motivated us to, you know, build the technology. But on the back end, we said, okay, that's great. Um, but what do, you know, the Dukes, the TVAs, what do, you know, the SMUDs, what do, you know, uh, Pacific Gas and Oil, like what do they actually need? They need to make sure they have reliable power 24 seven. And, and this has always been kind of one of the big, biggest criticisms of renewables. And this is actually why we find that at least our technology has a home with renewables because we can provide the capacity factor that currently doesn't exist at, at a grid level storage. Um, hopefully we will get there in terms of alternative storage capabilities, but levelized cost of electricity is king. Um, and even in a world where there are carbon taxes that are forcing people to go uh, lower CO2 emissions or no CO2 emissions, that still factors into the concept of levelized cost of electricity. So you have to look at all the factors. It's capital cost, it's capacity factor, it's tax regimes, it's tax benefits. And so um, that was one of the big lessons learned we had was you have to create a business case. It can't be um, what you want in terms of optimal performance as an engineer or scientist. It can't be what you want as uh, an idealist in terms of climate change. You have to actually look at who's going to buy and build this now and today. Um, and you know, I told Adrian in a separate message, climate change requires that we have infrastructure built now, not tomorrow, not you know, 100 years from now. We're not, we're not waiting for a prayer to bring us you know, the holy grail of, of something. Um, we have to look at what we have in hand as far as resources and if, as far as our resources with respect to research and resources with respect to EPC. Um, next slide, please. So I'll just kind of go through this real quickly because it's not really relevant to you know, what we're talking about today. So we developed a supercritical CO2 cycle. We combust oxygen um, uh, in the presence of methane and recycled CO2 at, at 30 megapascals, um, anywhere between 900 and 1200 C. We expand through a turbine, go down to about 30 to 40, um, three to four megapascals, do recuperative um, heat transfer, um, go to a water separation stage, uh, compress and pump the CO2, peel off a portion of the CO2 for sequestration or utilization, and then the rest goes back through the cycle. So it's an oxy fuel combustion system. It's basically like a high pressure steam cycle, but uses transcritical uh, CO2 as the working fluid. And what this system allowed us to do was to generate electricity um, at a levelized cost equal to that of CCGT today um, without capture, uh, while still allowing for sequestration and utilization of CO2. So this was the, the value proposition of what we're working on. But the real point here is we're talking about you know, air separation units, we're talking about advanced turbines, we're talking about heat exchangers, compressors, pumps, water separators, um, high pressure piping, high temperature piping. Um, these are all kind of the buckets that any thermal energy storage system at grid scale is going to have to deal with. You're going to be talking to the same contractors that we do uh, in terms of being able to deploy these units. And you need to understand how competent they are, how quickly they can move, what the supply chain looks like, et cetera. Because ironically enough, a lot of people don't realize when you're building projects like these, you're not necessarily um, in a vacuum. So when I want to buy my heat exchangers, I have to worry about uh, floating offshore platforms because they buy the same hardware. And so um, going from lab to actually building something, there's this massive supply chain learning that has to occur. You really have to understand, you know, has China, you know, had an uptick in terms of stainless steel consumption? And so now everything across the board is more expensive because nickel prices went up. And so those factors are things like levelized cost of electricity. When you start looking at thermal energy storage, are you using, you know, potentially catalysts uh, that are highly expensive? Um, this kind of factors back into my efficiency doesn't matter as much as uh, cost, uh, confidence and cost of deployment, reliability, and then ultimately capacity factor. Maybe a pebble bed reactor is not as, as efficient as a molten salt uh, storage system, uh, but what are potassium prices? You know, wh wh where, where is NAC today in terms of cost? And so that, that's kind of what we learned in this system is that when I wanna buy an air separation unit, I'm fighting against uh, the steel sector. Like, is there an uptick in steel production, basic oxygen steel making uh, in India and China because that's where the largest growth happens to be? You know, um, is there a large scale methanol plant going online in Iran? And have they ba basically booked up the next two years of production? 
Um, so these are kind of some of the hard lessons learned of like, you've got a great idea, you've got all these components, but other people are going to be competing with you. And if they've got basically um, faster timelines and better economics, you're going to be waiting. Um, next slide, please. So we'll just keep going. We're going to kind of dive into some of the lessons learned. Um, so one of the biggest and hardest lessons learned, I think the United States uh, acquired was in the late 2000s. We had this giant clean tech boom. You know, VCs, particularly in the West Coast, Northeastern United States, were pouring in tons of money. Problem is the timelines for returns were too short. Um, the experience in terms of management was not necessarily there. And a lot of the technologies we're talking about when it comes to thermal energy storage or mine, you require strategic investors that are going to take five to 10 years to actually usher in the project. When you get back to kind of what I was talking about supply chain, you want to order something like an air separation unit, you want to order something like an advanced heat exchanger, you're talking 18 months to two years before it shows up on site. Um, and that's after maybe a year worth of detailed engineering, that's after you got your funding, that's after you actually had a competent design to even show to an investor who used, uh, we'll say someone like Adrian or myself to critique your technology. So you're talking right off the bat, no matter what you're doing, if you're doing something that requires ASME, code approval, insurance, operators, long lead items, five years at a minimum um, to really build any of these projects. Um, you, you really can't do it any faster than that. And that means traditional capital routes that you know, have, we see in the tech sector are not gonna be acceptable for these kinds of projects. Um, and that's not to say there aren't investors out there who are leading the way, but as a general rule of thumb, you're really gonna have to start looking at people who are in it for the long haul and in it for big bucks. Uh, and that means looking at strategics. For example, like we had you know, uh, Eight Rivers I was part of, we invented the technology. So that was self-funded in terms of getting the, you know, the concept together. Um, but then we started to look at like, all right, at the end of the day, what does it take to build this? Um, we needed somebody who understood carbon dioxide. We need somebody who understood you know, running plants. We need somebody, somebody who understood building plants. And we had to fit into their strategic initiatives in terms of why they'd want to participate in a technology like this. You know, uh, big strategic energy companies do five to 10 year planning. So, you know, they're looking at the writing on the wall in terms of, of carbon emissions, et cetera. And that's really kind of what we, I wouldn't say exploited, but we went after We're like these firms all saw that the future of their business five to 10 years out required, they had to have low carbon technologies in their portfolio. And so they're willing to put a lot of money on the table to develop a technology like ours because they know that 10 years from now, they already have to have had that project in the planning cycle because these types of projects take five years to build. Um, that doesn't mean the money's easy to come by. You, the level of due diligence, if you're asking somebody for 50, a 50 plus million dollar check, it's gonna be a lot more than series A, B or C, especially when you're talking about technologies that have to have reliability, high capacity factor and have human safety um, as a concern. Um, so the upfront lift we had at Eight Rivers was a lot larger than you would find with, say, than like a, a technology app, because there's no such thing as agile engineering when it comes to building something that's at pressures and temperatures that could, could physically harm someone or uh, damage companies' reputation because they couldn't get electricity back on the grid for a couple of weeks, because they will suffer uh, probably millions of dollars of penalties that are actually a large chunk of the investment they're going to make in you, in you in the first place. Um, so to go from lab to industrial prototype is in this field is going to require a lot more work than I think people are used to. Um, you're going to have to get down to the level of actually developing preliminary P and IDs, equipment lists, uh, equipment data sheets. You're going to have to talk to people about transient operation, as Adrian said earlier. They're going to want to know that at least you started to think about the ecosystem they live in, and you've got the ball rolling. And and that's generally enough for them to feel that their experts should start working with you to actually you know, flesh it out and build out the technology. They get to a point where they do their own due diligence, maybe six months to a year later, and they're like, we're good to go. It makes sense, let's invest, let's keep building this, but I, I'll keep beating this dead horse. You know, Once you get the money, it just starts. It's now five years from that point before anything ever gets built. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so we kind of chatted a little bit through this. Uh, the cycle of building industrial technologies is not fast. There, it, there's no way you can really accelerate this other than 
you know, paying at least supply chain, you know, paying them large sums of money to basically push somebody to the back of the queue. And even that only guarantees you three to six months acceleration in terms of, of building a plant. You have to go through, you know, feasibility studies. You have to go to, you know, uh, pre front end engineering and design, then front end engineering and design. In those phases alone, probably take a year and a half, two years at best construction anywhere from a year to two years, depending on the complexity of your technology. Then you're going to go through commissioning and startup. That's probably three months. Then you've got a handover. And, and we're talking about best case scenario, post-investment, post you actually getting your ducks in a row to get someone interested in, in, in pushing the hardware. Um, so, and, you know, that's kind of, this timeline shows that, you know, we started with the idea in 20, 2010. We really only started doing the detailed engineering just in 2013, 2012, when I joined the company. And then right now we're moving to, you know, the commercialization phase. Um, so when you, when you talk about technologies that are gonna solve climate change, you, you, you kind of have to get real about what it takes to build them. What does the end customer want and reverse engineer whatever widget or concept you have to kind of fit the current mold of execution. Um, it's not ideal, it's not perfect. I can tell you I've personally been frustrated a million times as to like, why can't you understand this is potentially a better way to do it. Um, but you're kind of, you know, yelling at a wall um, simply because you, you have to deal with the talent and the resources that currently exist. That's not to say don't be shrewd and don't be picky about the people you work with, you know, the suppliers that, you know, um, are supporting your technology. But that's also going to take time too. I personally got on a, we'll say, global trip to visit every uh, uh, printed circuit heat exchanger manufacturer in the world to look at who actually had the furnace capacity to support our technology. And that's not something we ever thought about when we first started off. It's like, I'm in South Korea, I'm in China, I'm in Sacramento, I'm in the UK, like literally flying across the world to figure this out instead of doing detailed process engineering, which I was actually used to. And so it's, it's, it's those little things, well, I wouldn't say little things, it's those kinds of things that really um, make, I'll say ideation, I say ideation is maybe 10, 20% of a successful project. It's, it's, the, it's the, the grind of figuring out actually how to do it. It's like many of the people on this call are probably smart enough to know how to build a house, but you gotta go find who's gonna sell you the wood, when is it showing up? You know, what kind of nails are you going to use? Are you using galvanized nails? Not, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, so it's not about having a good idea. It's not about being smart enough. It's about really figuring out how to put the erector set together in detail. Um, next slide. So, I mean, this is just kind of to show you that, you know, we, we, what we put together, you know, this is quote unquote a prototype, but it's an industrial scale facility that was built to all applicable codes that an EPC firm would require. Uh, and the reason we did this was, um, uh, Adrian was saying, you know, you go from skateboard to scooter, et cetera. Uh, this is effectively the skateboard. Um, they need to see how this goes from 50 megawatt scale to something that's maybe 500 million to a billion dollars in scale. But there, there's a linear understanding with respect to their engineers, their EPC firms, you know, their bankers, et cetera. So you, you, you have to speak their language in terms of what you demonstrate. Otherwise, um, they're going to ask you to do it over again. And so this, this plant, a lot of people come here, I'm like, wow, this is a prototype. It's like, not really. It's a test facility that was built to all applicable ASME and API standards. And so, yeah, you spend more money, you spend more time, uh, but it saves you on the back end with respect to there being a linear understanding as to point A to point Z. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of where it gets fun uh, for those who are into process and systems design. So you, it takes you five to 10 years to build. You can't stop inventing. So anybody who's basically going to invest, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars as a strategic investor, because you're solving a problem of theirs they see in the future, and they're going to be your first customers. They also want to know there's longevity to what they're investing in. Um, so that's the other part of this kind of uh, Pandora's box is that you, you, you're doing all this other work, but at the same time, you have to keep inventing. You have to keep building optimization, new patents, et cetera, because you want to give them a reason to, to find that this is something that has 10, 20, 20, 30 years of life for the money they're going to put in. And so that's how you convince a lot of these larger strategics that make sense is that um, you're solving their problem initially and you're thinking about the problems they haven't even thought of yet. 
and, and that's that's kind of the value add for those you know who are are thinkers and, and future thought leaders of the energy sectors that don't stop inventing, don't stop filing. Um, as you move through the process of trying to go from ideation to execution, you're gonna learn a lot and write everything down and make sure you integrate it um, into new patents, new, uh, we'll say copyrights, new proprietary learnings, um, because that is how you make sure your technology actually continues to have an impact. So on that, I am done. So I'd say next slide and Thanks. leave it to questions. Thanks, Brock. And there's something I wanna emphasize here on this slide is, Brock, this is, uh, you have listed here 50 megawatt thermal. That's what this is. And that's 1 11th of the full scale. Um, some people in the audience might be thinking, um, you know, oh, you know, my technology is more modular, you know, maybe it's one megawatt, maybe it's half a megawatt, um, or, you know, mine's something, my technology is something that's going to be in the home, so I don't have to deal with, with these kind of construction challenges. I, I would argue that even in those scenarios, uh, you're still looking at a, 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 a situation where you're going to need a factory somewhere that's mm -hmm. going to be popping these things out like hotcakes, if you're really looking for the impact you want, and so that so the construction and supply chain challenges and a lot of the other things we're running into here, they're just transferred to that manufacturing. Facility. Yeah, right. different, <laughs> different players, same problem, um, yeah. different scale, but you're, you know, um, I've got a friend who uh, makes jewelry and uses supply chain out of Malaysia and, and China, and she has the same issues uh, that I do. You, you, you need to figure out uh, lead times, uh, factory capacity, um, you know, lowest cost bidder, quality control, it, it, it doesn't change. Right. Okay. Cool. So just one last slide here. I'm going to leave uh, homework for the audience. Um, if you want to read a few books uh, or, you know, some things about kind of the importance of having both good technology, but also good technology management, um, I would recommend reading these things uh, here. Uh, I found especially the making of the atomic bomb to be um, quite inspirational. Uh, inspirational in the sense of the amazing technology development that's possible when you have good leadership. Um, and so I'll just leave that up and we can go to questions. Right, uh, Adrian and Brock, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. It's uh, wonderful to see uh, um, the connection between the two talks of very early stage technology development and deployment at scale. Um, so we have a number of questions, but I thought I would just start with my own, um, if you can indulge me. You know, being a, a materials person, I always try to draw analogy um, to system level challenges versus something smaller. And the, the example that I came up with is the semiconductor industry. So the semiconductor, in the semiconductor industry, we can very effectively develop the device, right? Based on known laws of physics and design rules. And the unknown there is the cost learning curve and the yield. So that's very difficult to predict uh, ahead of time. You can have a perfectly working device, but it's just very low yield to produce. And the purpose of the piloting, the mass production, is to learn the cost curve and then to learn and improve the yield. And that ultimately determines the success of the product. In large energy systems like thermal energy storage technologies, what is the thing you're trying to learn through the piloting? Um, let me be more specific here. What is it that you can readily simulate and design on paper with very high fidelity? What is preventing us from getting a plus minus 10% estimation today uh, at the design level and not be surprised by significant cost overrun in the actual piloting of the process? Um, in other words, you know, why are we seeing technology with attributes and metrics that's often overpromised and underdeliver rather than the other way around? So is this a technical problem or this is something else? Love to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, you want to go first, Adrian? I, I can rant about this. <laughs> um, so uh, let's look at IGCC. Uh, Well-established technology, uh, understood, huge players in terms of who is supporting the hardware. 
but every single plant that was built was effectively treated as first of the kind. What was the issue here? Project management. Um, clearly, you've got your issues when it comes to, you know, fuel stock variability. You've got to deal with, you know, the chemistry concerns when it came to gasification. Um, but that's on the gasifier side. Uh, I think a lot of these industrial technologies kind of fall into the void of people in silos, just business as usual. And when you start asking them to do something that they're not accustomed to, um, they just apply the same uh, metrics and you end up with something that looks like uh, Frankenstein's monster as opposed to the beautiful vision you once had you know, when you started off the project. And so it's, it's really being somewhat of a helicopter parent and making sure you oversee that entire process from ideation to execution such that you're, you're talking to the people who are selecting the materials. For example, you know, there are no shortage of materials I could use that come from, uh, we'll say the turbine space that have the allowable stress profile that are required, but they're not ASME code approved. They had to have gone through 100,000 hours of, of, of process um, for stress analysis in order to be insurable. So that means that I ask somebody who's used to either the power sector or the chemical sector, they're gonna use different ASME codes, which means they'll select different materials. And this has nothing to do with whether or not they're suitable for the process, but it has a massive impact on cost and timing. And so that's, if you're not paying attention to the people who are building your system and what they're doing to build your system, um, it's gonna get lost in the weeds. And that's why I use IGCC as an example. That's a technology that when coal prices were lower than gas prices, there's no reason it shouldn't have proliferated. It was that there were constant cost overruns. Um, many brilliant people involved but you have to have a maestro who's basically overseeing it at all times. If the sector, if, if, if the workforce is not used to building what you're asking them to do, they're gonna do things the way they're used to it. And that often leads to inefficiencies. Well, let me answer the question with a different way, in a different direction. Um, let's go to the, the material science uh, example. Um, often there are issues of and you know, I'll kind of roll my eyes when I say this, uh, unknown unknowns. So let's say we're trying to figure out if a given metal alloy corrodes in, in a certain environment so that you know, our parts don't fail after one year of use. Um, you think that uh, adding the working fluid to that specific alloy in a specific materials test is enough uh, to determine the lifetime of that piece. Uh, you might thermally cycle it. Uh, you might uh, put it under stress, stress or tension to, to figure this out. Uh, but then when you put it in the real plant, uh, you find that these parts are failing anyways, even though you ran all of these tests. And for example, some of the unknown unknowns there might be, oh, uh, when, we when we built this system, these pipes were exposed to humid air with you know, water content in it. And these water molecules created uh, sensitive regions in the metal lattice that made them susceptible to corrosion at a later time. Uh, so it's, it's, there's a lot of really nuanced things to how you select your metal alloy. What do you, uh, do you have to keep things dry and under vacuum as you're building the plants? When you turn it on for the first time, are there gonna be oils from things upstream or downstream that are gonna contaminate this thing temporarily and sensitize it. There's just so many different things to take into account. And I, I think kind of where, where you were going with your question is like uh, kind of the digital twin question. Can we make uh, a good enough digital twin uh, of a plant if we had, if we understood the physics well enough? Like, could we do an Aspen model on steroids or something like that and really account for everything? Um, I suppose in, in theory you could, uh, but to be honest, I don't know if I would be able to predict all the important physics. I don't know if I would be able to know all the unknown unknowns, especially in a first of a kind plant. And it, it's kind of like, you know, when you're running experiments in academia, it's like, why do you run the experiment instead of just modeling it? Because when you run the experiment, you learn things and bad stuff happens <laughs> and sometimes good stuff happens. Uh, but that's like a critical part to the learning and design process is actually making it run. So, so digital twins are very useful and they get you, I don't know, 80% of the way, something like that, but you, you still need something a little bit more beyond that. 
Thank you, Adrian and, and Brock. I, I really resonate with that point as an experimentalist. Uh, you're always surprised by what you see, good or bad. Um, I have a, a follow-up question on this, and it will bring uh, E um, and Ravi back for a, um, a discussion in the panel. So, Adrian, if I, I think about this digital twin concept, right? I agree that um, it, it can only go so far, but it can certainly help. And I just want to also point out in the battery um, long duration storage area, we're facing a very similar challenge, which is, you know, uh, Brock spoke about insurability, bankability. Um, you know, the lifetime of long duration storage isn't really proven and even accelerated evaluation is a problem, right? So can, do we really know if, you know, even if lithium ion is going to last 25 years, um, which is, is uh, uh, say, that, that's what is needed to make financial sense. Uh, we won't know until the real test comes back in and even the acceleration itself is questionable. So Adrian, I think what you're describing sounds like a related problem, but even at a larger scale. Um, and you know, your example of um, uh, you know, uh, humid, humid um, attack, humidity attack on metals is, is a very good one. So you don't know what you don't know until you try it. So I don't know if Adrian and Brock, you can comment a little bit on your thought you know, for systems that are supposed to last 25 and 50 years, how do we, how do we accelerate that process so we can make bigger bets today rather than 25 years later until the first batch of plants have gone through it? And, and I just want to point out, consumer electronics is really being at the forefront of this. Is, that's what it enabled the battery revolution for electric vehicles is they brought in that three to five year demonstration that was needed and then gave people confidence that battery can be safe. And then that went on to, you know, 10 years for EVs and that will go on to enable 25 years um, in grid storage. I mean, I, I think you kind of hit the, the nail on the head there. You're talking about billions of dollars being effectively deployed for demonstration. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's kind of where you end up with these industrial scale technologies. It's not gonna necessarily be billions of dollars, but you know, we do things in the oil and gas and energy sector like RAM analysis. Um, and so you would do the same thing. You would look at failure points, you would look at do, what are capital spares and you would actually say that, okay, I actually expect, you know, a heat exchanger to fail at least once in the lifetime of the plant. So I'm gonna carry, you know, an extra X millions of dollars amortized across the life of the facility and assume that's actually my levelized cost of electricity and that's what I'm going to a bank with because you're gonna expect that kind of risk premium to be um, uh, you know, integrated. And so if it doesn't fail or you get an extra, we'll say five, 10 years, it just means the operating, you know, the OPEX was improved and, and the facility made more money, but you gotta factor those things in from day one. If anyone can poke a hole in your technology and tell a, uh, an investor, if particularly a bank who's gonna put in, we'll say hundreds of millions of dollars, they're going to shy away. They want to know that at the very least, you know, your conservative return on investment is something that actually turns a profit. And so that's kind of the, the, the cynical truth, you know, that I've encountered is that you have to assume they're going to poke at everything that could go wrong. They're going to have their own engineers and scientists look at what you're doing. And if they can argue logically that, you know, it makes sense that you should have, you know, spares, you have to take that into consideration. And Brock, just a, a quick follow-up, and then we'll move to the panel. Is there, you know, in terms of, say, um, mean time before failures for all the components that would go to a large uh, power plant or a thermal storage plant, do we already have very reliable numbers? And, you know, is there a body that is estimating these MTBFs for new technology coming out, new materials, new chemistry? Um, you know, I, I'm guessing that if you know the MTBF, you can calculate the cost pretty readily and the, the cost of service in the system? The, the answer is yes and no. The answer, mm -hmm. Yes, it exists. Um, any of the large oil and gas companies, any of the large EPC firms, power firms, they have this data in-house. Um, it's stuff that they're used to doing. They, um, it, you're not going to find it on the internet. You're going to actually have to talk to people who work in these sectors. Um, it is annoying. It is hard. Um, but it, it you know, uh, for example, a Ramco could tell you how often a fuel gas compressor fails, a reciprocating fuel gas compressor fails, and what the capital spares are going to carry because given their environmental conditions, you know, within plus or minus two months, major overall has to be done. Um, so they, they do know this, um, but when it comes to like new components, that's where it gets hard. Nobody has the knowledge, for example, like in my technology, 
we're developing, um, we're working with a novel turbine. Everything else is, is you know, exists. It's just being used in a, a new way. And so you start having to do from like the ground up assessment, risk assessments in terms of what is known, how is it being put together in a novel way? What is the risk profile? And then they still add a margin on top of that. And Adrian, I defer to you on this because you've had a lot more work with novel uh, hardware than I have. Yeah, I, I was actually going to answer this similarly, um, which which is to say that as much as possible, you have to pull it from what's already out there. Um, you know, if, if you're designing a novel component, try as much as possible to pull from the the past data and expertise of building this, the same or similar component. Um, another potential way to get around this or to work with this is. Uh, Think about creative ways to make your tech more modular. Um, the, the example that comes to mind is, I think it's the, the Tesla Gigafactory. That's actually a modular factory. They, they brought it online in chunks. And so the very first one, they bring it online, they start making parts. They realize it's, you know, things are breaking down, not working how, exactly how they like. But then the next module that comes online, it's incorporating the learnings from the first one. And the third one is incorporating learnings from the second one. And then, you know, you kind of go from there. And so if you're able to do that sort of thing, you might be able to kind of knock out some of these longevity and reliability things a bit faster just because you have a, a technology iteration cycle that's, that's a bit faster. Um, Thank you, Adrian. Um, I, yeah, I, I can't help to also notice an analogy to the aviation industry. And that's where, you know, safety really matters. Uh, iteration cost is very high. The number of prototypes are very limited, um, uh, say for passenger uh, airplanes. So that's also something that I've been thinking a lot about what we can learn from the aviation industry. Uh, but I see he has a question. And then also, I think uh, Ravi, we can have you also join as well. We have about 23 minutes left. Uh, we can have a spirited discussion on, on all of these topics. Uh, e, please. I'll just go ahead and ask my uh, question. Oh, uh, Adrian, thank you so much. I think I resonate very well on uh, your general comment, what's happening. Um, and maybe this is, uh, this is more like a common sharing with you, the experience. Now come back to the uh, lithium ion batteries. And this lifetime, uh, the, uh, the learning takes decades. Uh, 91 lithium ion batteries coming out, you, you have what, 150 cycles, roughly 200 cycles, that's about it. And then about 2000 also, now that's about 10 years later, right? In the commercial space, people learn how to get to 500. That's about 500, 2000, 2005 range. Now 30 years, fast forward, I will just say we are roughly about maybe 3,000 cycle, except lithium ion phosphate, you know, in the good cases, 10,000 cycle. So 30 years, just look at the cycle life we learn. Uh, well, we, from a, a two years lifetime calendar life, you know, we, you know, a year or two, to now maybe about 10 years, but this is still depend on temperature. Agent, I really like your comment about, well, if you can leverage the learning from the past, already accumulate in terms of reliability life. You want to utilize that. So I want to resonate with that. And for Brock, I have a question for you. I'm listening to your, this new technology, right? In about decade long, you achieved this uh, progress. It's really amazing, right? Since you're starting in about 20, uh, 2012 um, to now. So um, this CO2 generation burning oxygen used as a working food, um, so eventually you're going to keep burning methane, having the CO2. I, I didn't quite catch right away. There's a lot of exciting information, right? And then, and then you have a super critical one as working fluid. Eventually, eventually you're going to have a lot of CO2 generated. Where, where do you, what do you do with that CO2 again uh, after you have that? Is it injected under the ground? That's the- Yeah, eventual. so um, there's utilization either enhanced oil recovery, uh, pure sequestration and saline aquifers or depleted oil and gas reservoirs. A okay. lot of people don't realize there's 5,500 miles of CO2 pipelines already in the United States that go into sequestration cap capable uh, reservoirs. So um, yeah, the, the, the goal is either use it for building materials, value added products or sequester it, but not in the atmosphere. Yeah, okay. So I, I wanna make a comment on this whole idea of modularity and scale up and stuff, okay? And I'll tell you, I'll give me, let me give you a story. A very good friend of mine who works in Wall Street. 
and, and they, they finally they control the money. Okay. He told me, hey Ravi, I have seen a lot of photovoltaic panels on lampposts and stuff. I've never seen a big factory or a or turbine-based plants in my life, right? So, so the, uh, the people who control the money, right? They see the batteries, the CPVs, right? But large-scale plants, it's just not visible to them, okay? They, you have to be a much more sophisticated investor. That's one. Second is, and I'm a mechanical engineer, but the challenge with mechanical engineering machines is that, if, look at a turbine. If you make a one kilowatt prototype, that efficiency is gonna be 5%. And then if you pay a 50 megawatt turbine, that is going to be 50%, okay? So as mechanical engineer and as researchers, all of us have advanced degrees and we can understand, oh, I can model the heck out of it and I can show you 5% at five kilowatt, but it's going to be 50% when I build the whole 50 megawatt plant. Wall Street is not buying that, okay? That's, I don't understand this. <laughs> I, there's too much of risk in saying that from 5% to 50%, these guys are telling me, okay? So that's another major reason that, that large scale plants have financing challenges. So that, I, I want to bring it back to research. If mechanical machines, modularity can be achieved with similar efficiency, high efficiency, where there's some fundamental challenges there, that will lead to significant deployment, acceleration in deployment, right? And that is, by the way, that is the, one of the main reasons CSP plants was a PV, PV2 cover, why? Because a five watt PV, and five megawatt PV almost will have the same efficiency. You just stack them, you add them, uh, in a, in a, you just multiply, right? There's no non-linearity in the system. Those are some of the things which has a big impact on the financing of the projects. And I think that long duration stores, same thing will happen. We have a bunch of ideas right now based on turbines and mechanical machines. And I think again, people will ask, show me at scale. Don't tell me that you can just do it on paper. I, I agree with you 100%. And that's exactly why I said, if you're asking for these large amounts of money to take multiple years for deployment, you have to go to people who understand the problem you're trying to solve. Yes. It can't just be, as they say, dumb money. It has to be people who really, like you're solving a pain, pain point for them and they have the capital to actually to do something about it. And so it, it is hard. You, you can't just, not everybody with a checkbook is gonna be useful. So, so let me throw out a, a crazy idea that touches both on modularity as well as lifetime. What if we took a lesson from the consumer electronics industry and we did planned obsolescence of components or systems? I know Brock's gonna roll his eyes and say, no way you, you crazy PhD person. But I wonder if, if there's something there. It may be better to know exactly when a component is going to fail rather than than not knowing. So if I can say in a predictable way that this component's going to last five years and then I will replace it, uh, it's probably better than like, yeah, it lasts seven years or seven, eight, nine, ten, but it fails when you're not expecting it and your whole plant goes down and you lose a bunch of money. So, um, you know, is, is there a way to work that into our, our thermal engineering system design? Uh, that, that already exists. Uh, so I'm not rolling my eyes. I'm actually agreeing with you. Um, it's the, it's the LTSA model in the energy sector. It's the whole idea that you reduce CapEx, you, you push it on OpEx. It really depends on who owns the plant, who's building it, who's financing it. For example, um, there's no issue with like gas turbines uh, having hot gas path components wore out on a regular basis if the initial capital cost to build the plant is X. And the reason they, you know, that's something that's tolerable is Nobody knows what power pricing is going to be when they first build a plant, you know, 10 years from now. Nobody knows what gas prices are going to be. So the industrial sector does do this at scale. Um, it's just done what, what they call long-term service agreements. Um, and for example, a lot of some gas turbine, uh, some gas turbine vendors who shall not be named um, will actually sell you their gas turbines at a loss um, because they're intending to make up all their money on the service agreements. Uh, so yeah, no, that's that's right on the money in terms of thinking about your technology, you just have to inform investors that you expect there's planned failures. I mean, I would, I would say that is, I will not name companies either, but there are people, their fundamental reliability challenges has not been solved. Then you come up with a modular swappable ideas, okay? And then the thing fails, you just come in and swap it with another one, right? But fundamentally you have not made it highly reliable. It is the same technology. Everybody knows there's a lot of reliability issues. So, there are, there are those models which has evolved. So here's another thought. 
Um, let's take our nuclear fission fleet. It's getting quite old, built a long time ago. I think they were built to have what, 20, 30 years of life. Now they're being extended. A lot of them are being extended for another 10, 20 years. Uh, I might have those specific numbers incorrect, but the, the idea uh, correct. What are they doing? How are they modifying their plants to extend them by 20 years? Is there something we can learn there and apply them to our first of a kind plants? I, I don't know what, what the answer is, but maybe it's worth talking to them. It's, it's kind of a, well, I'll use the coal plants in this country as an example. It's kind of a myth when you say coal plants built for 20 to 30 years, but, you, but they're running 50 years later. Uh, nothing there is 50 years old. You know, you're constantly recycling, you know, retrofitting, components are being replaced. Maybe the reactors are not being replaced, but you're, you're you, it's, it's like, I think there's a, a, a stat that the, the human body replaces its skeleton in terms of tissue 13 times over in the lifetime of a human being. It's the same thing. You wouldn't say that you had 13 skeletons, but realistically, the material recycle rate allows for that. And that's kind of true of these large facilities. I mean, that's how you've got, um, there are large oil and gas companies in Texas uh, that have refineries that have been in operation for a hundred years. Nothing there is likely a hundred years old besides maybe the original operator. Uh, so so that's, that's, you know, that's the reality of these, these plants. Plan, plan, for, plan for obsolescence, plan for longevity. It just, you have, you have to fit a financial model for whoever's gonna be buying whatever you're selling. Let me add my two cents to this too. I, I'm really resonating with this discussion. And I, modularity, I think, has another big opportunity, which is it could be a proving ground for new unproven um, technology so you don't have to build out the whole system. And again, I pointed to consumer electronics as a very good example how it catalyzed the battery revolution is that every year we put in a slightly better battery, as E pointed out, and we keep learning, keep iterating. In large system, this is not possible, but perhaps we can consider doing it at a modular level. You know, maybe we try out a less proven um, system um, with some sort of a limited scope. I think uh, certainly in the entrepreneurial sense, people want to build this whole entire new system that's completely revolutionary, but perhaps there's an opportunity for smaller scale development in conjunction with existing projects for you to pilot something out. So I don't know if this is something that um, is feasible or makes sense, but just lower the entry to getting some field data as quickly as possible in order to de-risk the technology. Uh, I think we're seeing this very hugely in the battery field, right? You can now build a small component in a battery and you can try it out um, and you can see how it works. And because and that, the by, by the way, that is where mechanical systems differ okay, from a solid state system. Fundamentally, they're different, okay? Because mechanical systems, you have a battery, when you have a one water battery or a megawatt hour battery to a large extent, you then stack them together, you just multiply in the number, right? As I said earlier, if you look at a turbine, you look at a rea chemical reactors, which about, right? You just, small scale system has a much lower efficiency than a large scale system. Even the lab scale, right? When we do experiments in the lab, you, you see any paper, they'll say, oh, I did a small scale, I have a lot of heat losses, I here's a thermal model, and at act scale, this will look like this, right? That's great. PhD students and postdocs and professors can understand that. An investor will not understand that. They'll say, oh, I'm not giving you millions of dollars based on a model that you're telling me that it'll be really, really good. So I think that's what I was saying, right? That if you can actually fundamentally solve that efficiency issue in mechanical systems and thermal mechanical thermal system at small scale, which requires a different kind of research mindset, right? That will move these systems big time, okay? I mean, I mean but I, I have not, I mean, there have been a lot of talks on this, that how do I make it modular in, but even chemical reactors, same thing. Fischer-Trop, you probably have heard, right? Oh, Fischer-Trop will solve everything. I can have a CN gas and I can create every kind of, $30 billion, my friend, one plant, $30 billion. Who's gonna put, give you that money? Yep. Because if you make a small scale Fischer-Trop Fischer system, man, I mean, the yield is going to be very, really, really low. So, so Ravi, uh, this is good point. You are running a cyclotron role. Um, so what about, uh, what, what will be the mechanism and national lab and university? We can do a little bit more. Instead of centimeter square, can we go to about meter square uh, of kind of device, right? Can we go to, uh, you know, uh, not 5%, somewhere in the middle, not 50% efficiency, that costs too much, but somewhere in the middle to prove out a little bit more. What's the financing mechanism we can do this type of uh, 
R, R and D. I mean, Stanford right here, I mean, we try to change that by starting a new school on sustainability. The uh, accelerator program, this will be set up. We hope to be able to do some of those to build up the financing people's confidence of, uh, hey, this is, uh, we are getting to next step now. Uh, so uh, any thought? Because you, you have been doing a cycle for a while. By, by the way, you're asking a very, very good question. See, I've had a lot of discussion and debates internally as well, that what is the minimum scale at which you have de-risked enough, right? The people, the investor will say, I can see it, right? I think, I do not know. I, I Somehow I feel, based on everything that I've seen, at least megawatt in mechanical systems is, is the number. Brock has direct field experience. Uh, maybe at least you may need two data points, at least for, a, for an investor to say that, okay, it is, the efficiency is increasing the size. I mean, you know, I, I, I just, I think every mechanical system that I've seen, it starts to taper off around five megawatt or something. Brock, you have any thoughts? Um, I, I completely agree with you because for example, what I'm doing, you know, we have a first of a kind control system, but whether or not it's controlling a one megawatt or 500 megawatt facility, it's still the same control system. So it's pretty easy and straightforward to deal with. Um, when it comes to things like the compressors and pumps, it's like, is it in the same frame size family or in the same technology family? So you can go as small as you can, but as someone had already demonstrated 10 X larger, and that's what we actually had to do in our facility. When it comes to mechanical systems and sometimes chemical systems, it's really difficult. Uh, for example, you know, all the talk about post-combustion capture on CCGT, uh, the columns that have to be built have never actually been demonstrated in terms of mass transfer and the kinetic rates that would occur as a result of the sorbents interacting with CO2 because you're dealing with heat fluxes, you're dealing with changes in the actual internal velocities as the fluid moves up and down. So to Robbie's point, like you, you do have to prove it to the extent the market understands or investors, you know, point A to point Z. Um, sometimes you can't do that because the cost of doing it is just too big for an academic institution or a national lab. But that's where, to Adrian's point, you take what's actually been done in the field and you start to kind of hybridize uh, what you can do in the lab with um, computer simulation, trying to extend it based on practical real world experience. I mean, you think about it, every refinery that's ever been built on the face of the earth is effectively a first of a kind because it's a different chemistry, it's a different environment, it's different hardware, but they're extrapolating based on previous experience. And I'm, I'm using that because it's a chemical reactor system, it's a mechanical system. You're dealing with uh, things that don't have modularity per se, uh, but it, modularize as much as you can, as long as the physics don't change, as long as the economics work, if you don't modularize, you're shooting yourself in the foot. I mean, I would say that even in carbon capture, almost all carbon capture plants are based on thermal energy, right? I mean, you're basically using heat to dissolve the CO2. You know, similar issues, your scale matters there too, right? So, so even the carbon capture, if everybody's very serious about carbon capture and it looks like there's a broad uh, agreement worldwide now that we'll be happy to carbon capture, you'll have the similar issues to financing some of the mega projects. Hi, uh, we have five minutes left. Um, I think uh, this one question we absolutely need to take from the audience. We have a lot of students uh, listening. This is a question about, uh, well, just to be brief, uh, one minute per person, right? How can current student, PhD, engineer, scientists tune their studies to prepare more for careers and energy? One minute otherwise, uh, who wants to take that first? After this question, we'll wrap up the day session. I mean, I can go first. Let me just say one thing, which I, I have also a lot of students. What I tell them is that, how do you fit your science into the broader, you, have, you need to understand the scale of the problem in the energy sector, appreciate the scale of the problem and also have some idea of techno-economics, then, then see how your science can really help move the needle in the big time. This is really a very RPE mindset. I think really good, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, frog and agent. Yeah, agent first. Uh, I guess I would maybe say uh, two concrete things that you can do um, as a student. Do a lot of do as many co-ops as you can. Go work in industry for a little while. See how people talk. See what skills are important. See how people make decisions. See how they influence others. Um, the other firm recommendation is if you can get into a good uh, MBA program at a good university. 
uh, this might be a way to kind of shortcut a lot of the early career learning so that you can be a more effective engineer with these kind of larger infrastructure projects. Stanford and Berkeley's uh, business schools are not too bad, so walk. <laughs> um, I would say uh, if you're just graduating, look at what technologies realistically can be implemented in the next five to 10 years and find the companies that are going to do that um, because those are the firms that are going to help you right out of school, um, get the experience that's needed to kind of transition into the real world. Um, if you want to stay in academia, that's a, that's a very different discussion. If you want to kind of go into the private sector, look at who's actually going to build the stuff that's capable of being built five to 10 years from now. Um, because you, you, you might find that uh, the pool's either very large or very small, but if you, if you want to have an impact, uh, do the sniff test of what's realistic in terms of what's going to be on the project list in the near future. Yeah, blog, it's a good thought. You can learn about both about still R&D still having right there. You can learn about scaling as well for the, you know, the technology implemented five to 10 years. Will, back to you. Wonderful. This is great learnings. I think if I uh, add everything up, what, what you all just said is really innovating and delivering at scale, this is really the challenge for all of us. Um, no, I'm so glad to be joined by all of you doing this every day. Um, so again, thank you so much, Ravi, Adrian, and Brock um, for this very well-connected set of talks on how to get things from the lab to the real world. Um, thank you once more. And if I can, Kaylee, have the exit Skype, uh, slides, please. So uh, we have two um, more talks uh, this fall quarter. So in two weeks, we will have a session on circular economy of lithium ion batteries. And we're very pleased to um, host uh, leaders from Northvolt and BSF uh, to talk about um, battery recycling and reuse. And then to end the quarter, we're going to have uh, Jessica Transic from MIT, who will also discuss, like today, system level considerations for generations uh, storage and renewables. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you again for tuning in today, and uh, please connect with us online. Thank you very much, and have a great day.